Life Law 8. We teach people how to treat us. Don't make yourself a mouse or the cat will eat you. A.B. Shields. Why you should read this life law. To start controlling and stop complaining about your relationships. Learn to renegotiate with everyone in your life to get the treatment that you want and deserve. She could hear her dad snoring and their bedroom TV was off. So Jane was sure that her parents were asleep. She slipped out of the house and quietly raised the garage door. Without starting the engine, she pushed the family car out to the street. Then a good 20 yards from the house, Jan started the car and was gone. She was loving it, freedom. It was midnight and she headed to her friend Marcy's house. For a 15 year old girl, Jan knew her way around town pretty well. She had made the trip to Marcy's house at least 20 times, all of them after midnight. Her dad had once asked her if she was taking the car out when no one was around, but she had given him a very persuasive answer that she wouldn't ever do such a thing. When she got to Marcy's, she tapped on the bedroom window. No answer. Marcy wasn't home. It was stupid not to have called, but she didn't want to wake up Marcy's parents. Oh well, Jan thought. I'd better return home. No harm done. As Jan pulled up to her house, she turned off the ignition and coasted it into the driveway like she always did. There, to her shock, she found her father, not asleep like he was supposed to be, but standing instead with his hand extended asking for the keys. Jan was terrified. Oh God, I'm dead now, she whispered. But all her dad said was, go to your room. For three days, her father said nothing. Then the day before her 16th birthday, he asked Jan to take a ride with him in the car. He drove her to the Ford dealership. Once there, her dad had a brand new Ford Mustang brought up for Jan to test drive. She was ecstatic. This was her dream car, a bright red convertible with a white top and a CD player. With her dad in the passenger seat, Jan drove the Mustang up and down the streets, squealing with delight, then headed back to the dealership. She and her father went into the dealer's office. Jan couldn't believe it. This was really going to happen. Then the, the dealer handed Jan's father a check. What, Jan asked confused. I'm getting a refund on the Mustang you just drove, said her dad. It was going to be your 16th birthday present. What is this story about? It's just a story about a girl who got hammered by some very strict parents. That's what Jan thought had happened to her. For weeks, she went around school talking about how cruel her father was, how he had publicly humiliated her, how he had set up a scene at the dealership just to teach her a lesson. She was convinced her parents were really, really mean. She was completely missing what had happened. Renegotiating your relationship. As you know from reading the previous life laws, people size you up based upon the way you present yourself to the world. Through their presentation, they are deciding what you can bring to their life and what they can bring to yours. They are deciding what they can do for you and what you can do for them. They are deciding what they can accept from you and what you will accept from them. In other words, they decided how to treat you. When making this decision, they will be essentially test you. And based on your response to their tests, they will either continue with their initial way of treating you or they will change their approach. Do you see what this means? It means that you get to greatly influence their decisions. You can be the one who sets the tone. If you refuse to accept anything but the best, you'll get the best. Begin to live as you wish to live. If you reward someone's behavior by reacting in a way they desire, you are likely to see that behavior again. If you respond in a way that they find undesirable, you are less likely to see that behavior again. Don't kid yourself. This is true and will always be true with almost everybody you encounter. It even applies to your enemies, particularly when you both occupy the same rung on the social ladder. If someone at school is continually taking unfair pot shots at you, you are somehow rewarding this behavior, however unintentionally, or that person wouldn't continue it. In reality, you have somehow communicated by word or deed and taught that person that his or her behavior is acceptable to you. That means you must own rather than complain about how people treat you. For you and me as young people, this is a great life law for us to understand because it truly teaches us how to greatly influence key situations in our lives. Please know that for the vast majority of you, I'm including your parents in this equation. I know that a lot of you say that you simply don't have control or even any influence over your life. You feel like you don't have control because you live with your parents and they decide what you get to do. When you get to do it, 
who you get to do it with. They get to decide everything. But that is only true in, to an extent. Just like Jan, the girl who lost her Mustang, you clearly have at least some control over what your parents do. Because parents are the people we encounter most frequently, and also the people who now have the most control over our lives. I'm going to focus primarily on parents in this chapter. Even if our parents set boundaries and limits that we have to follow, we can have an influence over what those boundaries are. Sometimes, if we are smart, we can get them to widen the boundaries within which we operate, all because we teach them how to treat us. Before we go any further into Life Law 8, I want to make sure that we have the same understanding as to what a typical interaction with your parents is like. Do you feel like your parents don't listen to a word you say? Do you ever want to remind your parents that your third birthday was a long time ago, so they will quit treating you like a toddler? Do your parents give you a long lecture, including a list of you should-haves, while you're thinking, I could've, but I didn't? Do your parents give you a history lesson about when they were teenagers that is so boring you're thinking of marking it as a lullaby? Do you bring up a problem of yours, and your parents so often try to top it with a problem of theirs, that you are thinking of bringing up world hunger and nuclear warfare next time? Do you ever feel that your parents are convinced that you have three remaining brain cells and they are fighting? Do your parents pass out more advice than Dr. Drew and Adam Cora on Loveline? If you could relate with any of these above, take a look at the typical post-interaction reactions, then see if you have these reactions after a parental encounter. <clears throat> you feel totally ignored. You feel put down and condescended to. You feel so sick of being told what to do that you could scream so loud that glass in Antarctica would shatter. You feel that you may actually go crazy. You feel angry and frustrated. You feel more controlled than airport traffic. You feel hurt. So there's usually a standoff. You become frustrated and resigned to the fact that your parents are tyrannical controllers rather than thinking and feeling people. You figure there is nothing you can do to get your parents to see you as a young adult rather than a totally dependent child. But there's the only question on the table. Even if your parents are being unreasonable, what are you going to do to change the way they treat you? You taught them how to treat you. Now all you have to do is teach them how to treat you a different way. Red alert. Stop. Hold on. Time out. I need to clarify a huge exception to this law. This law only works if people with whom you are dealing with are not sicko freaks who need therapy or worse. You are, for absolute sure, entitled to be treated with dignity and respect. If someone is rude or inconsiderate, that's one thing. If they are physically, mentally, and emotionally abusing you, that's totally different. You do not need to teach them to do that. If you are being sexually molested, raped, or parentally neglected, it is not your fault. Repeat, it is not your fault. You don't own that problem. You didn't set it up that way. You may need help to change it or escape from it. If any of these horrible realities are in your life, don't try to get in the bad guy's face by yourself. Get help. You can do so confidentially without exposing yourself to danger. Teachers, pastors, counselors, and other trusted adults will help. You may be trapped and you may be in danger, but others will listen and intervene only when you feel ready and confident enough to act. But you must reach out and not continue to suffer in a terrible and lonely silence. Be there for yourself. You are worth it. Here are some numbers you can call for help. Rape and Abuse and Incest National Network, Child National, Child Help National Child Abuse Hotline, National Domestic Violence Hotline, and Crisis Hotline. Upstream Management. So with the understanding that we are talking about parents who may be tuned out and insensitive, but not sicko freaks, let's continue. When I say that you taught them how to treat you, I mean that you train them with your reactions in the same way you train your dog to sit or roll over. Think about it. Every time you and your parents interact, you respond in some way. Your response powerfully influences whether the reaction you got from your parents will repeat itself in the future or not. If, for example, you reach out to your mother by wanting to share a problem with her, and she half ignores you because she is watching TV, and you should shrug your shoulders and walk off, then you have rewarded her by withdrawing and eliminating the demand that you are placing on her. In sum, you have just taught her that if she will just ignore you, you will go away. If your parents tell you something you don't want to hear, 
and you blow up, yell, scream, stomp off to your room, and slam the door, then you have rewarded their strictness by reinforcing their perception of you as childlike and immature. Once again, you ended the interaction and let them off the hook. You may also be teaching them how to treat you because you come to them only when you have some ridiculous question or problem that they have no option but to dismiss or discipline you for. Questions like, can I quit school and join a gang? Or can you spot me some beer money? When you act like this, again, you have taught them to deepen their perception of you as a responsible individual. You can also teach people how to treat you by what you don't say. For example, you have been out with your friends and come in, however reluctantly. 15 seconds before curfew, and go straight to the refrigerator or to your room to get on the phone. Your parents track you down, and the conversation goes something like, Parent, well, it's about time you got home. Do you just sit outside until the clock ticks right down to the limit? You, hey, I got home on time. What do you want? Parent, what did you do tonight? You, nothing. Parent, where did you go? You, nowhere. Parent, who were you with? You, nobody. Parent, did you have a good time? You, I did until I had to come home before everybody else. Thank you very much. Parent, are you going to stay on the phone all night? You, probably, why? Parent, never mind, good night. Sound familiar? Here you have taught them to be nervous, really nervous about what you were doing when you were out. People have nothing to hide, hide nothing. You just taught them that you must have have something to hide and therefore they should be nervous. As much as that bites, you know it's true. So now let's just move on to getting them to stop treating you like a total moron. Let's move on to getting them to treat you how you should be treated. But remember, they are your parents, not your friends from school. So they will never treat you the same as your friends do. But it can get much better. You can get to a point where you can talk to your parents and get them to relate to you on a more adult to adult level as opposed to always wanting to discipline you or just degrading what you're saying. So what are we going to do is called upstream management. It's the old tail wagging the dog story. You may not be the one in power or control, but you have significant ability to get your parents to do more of what you want them to do and less of what you don't want them to do. All you have to do is change some key actions and reactions that you throw out there. Changes the way in which you are engaging your parents and they will change the way they react. If you interact with your parents in any of the following ways, it will greatly increase the amount of freedom and respect they give you. Behaving your way in a new relationship. One, initiate conversations with your parents. Two, remember they're your parents, so they will discipline you sometimes. Three, don't take the bait, stay calm. Four, become interested in your parents' lives and they will be interested in your life. Five, be realistic about what you expect your parents' reactions to be. Six, stop demanding and start earning your freedom. Seven, inspire confidence and trust through predictability. Eight, allow yourself to be influenced by your parents' advice. Nine, be easy to get along with. And 10, do not talk to your parents only when you have a problem, because if all you talk about are your problems, that is a problem. I wasn't expecting you. Keep in mind that if your parents are resistant at first, it's because you taught them how to be. You taught them really well, and now they have formed habits. Habits can be stubborn, but they can change. Keep trying, this will work. Anytime a relationship has gone on for months or years, both signs form the habits or expectations. You have come to expect your parents to respond in certain ways, and they have come to expect you to respond and behave in certain ways. The problem is on both ends. First and foremost, you tend to see what you're looking for. If you expect either of your parents to be negative, critical, and resistant to your ideas, that is most likely how you interpret their behavior, even if that is not how they are actually behaving. Second, we tend to conform to, what, to that which is expected of us. In other words, if they expect you to be a knothead, throw a tantrum, and be disrespectful, there's a tendency for the two of you to define your relationship in just that way. To make sure that you are delivering the message that you want and receiving what is actually being sent, you must check your expectations and figure out if you and your parents are setting yourselves and each other up for disaster. 
Realize that through your behavior, you can create new expectations with your parents that get you what you want. Expect me at one. When I was in high school, some of my friends were frustrated about and couldn't understand why my parents gave me more freedoms than theirs gave them and how I got in trouble less often than they did. The reason I was allowed more freedom is because this is one of the laws that sunk in when I was still in high school. I understood that I was teaching my parents how to treat me, that I was creating expectations that created more freedom for myself. I couldn't have labeled it like that, but I did know that I was teaching them how to treat me. I had heard my dad say a million times that results are the only things that mattered, that we can only judge our life based on results. I understood that my parents would determine the amount of freedom they gave me based on the results I gave them. So I was careful to give my parents results that demonstrated accountability, maturity, and the ability to handle freedom responsibly. In short, I was predictable. I went where I said I did, did what I said, and came home when I said. As a result, I got permission to do much more than I would have ever been able to sneak around and do. People learn by the results that you choose to give them. And in that respect, you are in control of every relationship you have. When my parents went out on a limb, let me do something further into the world of independence, I handled it well and did what I said I was going to, thereby setting me up for the next freedom. It was like stepping stones across a river. Every time I stood on one stone and didn't fall off, I could toss another one a little further into the stream and hop onto it. Pretty soon, I had the freedom that I really wanted. So what have you been teaching your parents? Have you been teaching them that you are reliable, predictable, and competent? Or have you been teaching them that you are going to break and run off every time you get half a chance? Seriously decide what you have been doing to set your relationship up, however it is. And remember, you are not a victim. I had a friend in high school who was a perfect example of how not to earn more freedom. To say that Jason did stupid things would be a compliment, because let me tell you, he almost didn't even get to life law eight. The very day that he got his car, he decided, I am free. He decided, I got a car and I don't have to come home. I don't have to call home. I don't have to tell my parents what I'm doing. I don't have to do squat. I finally got me a car. He left on Friday afternoon after school in his newfound freedom, AKA the Jeep, and hit the town. He spent the night out and didn't call home, didn't tell his parents where he was going, didn't tell them what he was doing. He was just his own man come Friday afternoon at 3.30. When he finally did come home late Saturday afternoon, only to get a change of clothes, I might add, guess what happened? Well, big surprise, his dad took his keys away from him. Now you're probably thinking, Jay, you just made that up to make a point. I wish I had, but I did not. I hated this because Jason was the oldest of our group of friends, and that meant that the rest of us lost his car too. By not handling his new freedom that came with having his own car, with maturity and discipline, by not coming home when he said he was going to come home, by not calling when he should have called, he taught his father, you have to give me a curfew, you have to give me strict rules and guidelines, you have to keep me on a very tight leash. He told his dad with his actions, I'm not going to do what I should do. I'm not going to do what you want me to do. So you have to make me do it. You have to give me strict rules and make me do the things that I'm supposed to. Because I'm telling you right now with my actions, I'm not going to do it otherwise. This is what his dad did. He took away his car for a month and gave him an 1130 curfew. Why do they do this? Just like Jason, you too are responsible for the way that your parents are treating you. You are either teaching or allowing your parents to behave and react to you the way they do. Remember, I'm talking about non-sicko parents. You do this by choosing how to treat them. If your parents won't listen to you and don't talk to you and don't respect you as a mature individual, it may be well because you're totally selfish and don't listen to them either. You ask questions and make declarations that are guaranteed to warrant resistance and negative reactions. Can I get a tattoo? Start smoking? Do drugs? Or just quit going to school? What the hell do you expect them to say? You get furious if you don't get the answer that you were looking for and immediately decide your parents are enemies. 
You demand rather than command the respect of your parents. Regardless of the actual reasons, your parents treat you in a way that you don't like. You greatly influence that treatment. That is both good news and bad news. It's obviously bad news because it means that we are accountable and responsible for so much of what everybody does to us, and that's a big burden. It's good news because that means that we are in a position of influence. If you are unhappy, you can change it all by yourself. You don't need active help and cooperation from anyone else. You can begin making huge changes in all of your relationships completely by yourself, simply by deciding that you will no longer accept behavior that you do not want. You are making an important commitment to change. So how do you improve the way your parents treat you? What to do? Let's take a look at the behaving your way in a new relationship list we looked at earlier. Review each item and ask yourself how you can incorporate each of these points into your interaction patterns with one or both of your parents. What do you suppose it would mean to your mother and father, for example, if you simply approached them just to ask about their day? When you didn't want anything, didn't need anything, and didn't have a problem to solve. How do you suppose it would make them feel when they walked away knowing that you took an active interest in their lives? That would probably cause them to treat you like an adult you were being. Again, includes each of these points in your interactions with people, along with some patience, and I think you will be amazed at the immediate changes you can create in your relationship with your parents. It's dark inside those lockers. Your power and ability to change relationships is not limited just to your relationships you have with your parents. You may be just as frustrated with that Neanderthal at school with the mama didn't love me tattoo on his biceps who keeps picking on you. You are sick of him stuffing you in the locker or stealing all of your lunch money, or just making an ass of you when everybody is looking. Or maybe you are sick of walking gossip column with the ponytail telling lies about you every time you turn your back. Well, good news. Just as in the relationship with your parents, you have tremendous power and influence in the situation as well. You can change it today. You can change it because once again, we teach people how to treat us. They don't decide on their own. Once you understand and begin to use this life law, your life will change for the better, and I mean immediately. Even though you may not currently see how or believe that you can change the way others treat you, make the decision right now that you will not give up and accept treatment that you don't want. You do have control. You do teach people how to treat you. Remember you are not a victim, so find your own ownership. I promise you it is there. And once you find it, the power to change is yours. Your job is to find out what payoffs you are creating that maintain the behaviors you don't like in others. Remember from Life Law 3, for any repetitive behavior, there are payoffs. And in relationships, you control the payoffs. For that reason, you are in control of every relationship you have. You can teach an old dog new tricks. Don't think, dang, I figured this out too late. My relationships with people like my parents and certain friends are so set in stone that I'm screwed forever. This is absolutely not true. All relationships can be renegotiated. You can reopen negotiations by either word or act. To do this, you have to identify what you are doing to support and allow the behaviors that you don't like in others. Once you have identified those, then you can start changing to make them change. And people will treat you in a different way. Of course, you know that there will be resistance. Anytime you change your relationship in a way that requires more of the other person or takes away something that they used to enjoy, there will be resistance. There will also be some resistance within yourself. One of the strange laws of human nature is that we tend to conform to the which, we, which is expected of us. In other words, if you are a jock and people expect you to do poorly in class, you tend not to study because people don't anticipate you making an A. If you're the class clown, you know how difficult it is not to act funny when a lot of people expect you to be that way. Or it's hard not to act like the stowed cold macho man if that's what other students expect of you. I have saved one of the most important concepts for last because I want to be fresh in your mind and stand out above all else. The most important relationship you will ever have and the one that sets the tone for every other relationship in your life is the relationship that you have with yourself. Everyone in your life will watch how you treat you, what you require of you, 
and whether or not you are willing to stand up for you. When you treat yourself with dignity and respect, you send a loud and clear message that you are now in a position of strength and power. You are sending a loud and clear message to better negotiate what you really want. You are in a better position to renegotiate how people treat you. From this position, you can teach people to perceive and treat you in the way that you feel you should actually be perceived and treated. If you do not have the conviction in your heart and mind as to who and what you are and what you require, you will always be creating more problems than you could ever imagine. You'll be letting people in your life who are not particularly interested in treating you with dignity and respect. You'll let people in your life who will treat you on less than a quality level. You'll let people into your life who will try to make you feel guilty, who will want to manipulate you, who will turn on you whenever the pressure is on. Ultimately, remember the principle of reciprocity. You get what you give. You should never expect people to give you something you are unwilling to give yourself. Light bulbs. People size you up based on how you present yourself to the world. People then test you to see how you allow them to treat you. You can control your life by working within the boundaries that you are limited by. You can reteach people how to treat you. Treat yourself well so others will be motivated to do the same.